Shana Tova. Let us welcome this new year with one voice on page six. Return again, return again, return to the land of your Shana Tova Tikatevu. We have arrived at the entrance way into another new year. May it be for you, for us all, one of goodness, health, life, love, and peace. Life is just full of surprises, isn't it? If someone had come to me on the day I was ordained as a rabbi 23 years ago and asked, what is the one thing that you are even more certain will never happen in your rabbinic career than leading the High Holy Days to a camera lens instead of a packed sanctuary? My answer surely would have been leading the High Holy Days to a camera lens twice. Never say never. The heartbreak about our having to gather without gathering again this year is just how close we came to enjoying a glorious homecoming in person tonight. That was our plan, starting back in May and continuing all the way through July. I'm guessing it's what you pictured back then, too. It's certainly what we pictured. And just our imagination of it brought so much joy and anticipation. It's hard to part with that vision of what could have been what almost was. Of course, if this pandemic has taught us nothing else. It has conditioned us to speak about the future with greater humility. That is to say, every time we have gotten used to this virus zigging, it has reliably zagged. So many of your plans for life cycle commemorations, for 
Family reunions for trips of a lifetime were made and broken and remade again differently. Truly, why should our High Holy Days be any different? The year 5781, which came to a close with the setting of the sun just minutes ago, was the year that the liturgy of these High Holy Days came alive for us, perhaps more disturbingly than ever. Who shall live and who shall die? Who by fire, who by water, who by earthquake, and who by plague? If ever these images felt somehow grandly distant, they do no more. And as the challenges of 5781 now carry forward into a new year, we know that we need these holy days and each other more than ever. And so I want to begin by thanking you, the members of our temple, the visitors also to our congregation who are creating this prayer community that none of us can see with our eyes, but all of us will feel with our souls. It is the very knowing that you are here that enables us all to be a part of something high and holy on these days, and your commitment to creating that, sustaining that in your life is what enables us to sustain it in ours. That is Leo Beck Temple, you. And now we already know how to create that blessing without even being in the same room. And so for keeping this body healthy throughout this past year, again, as we greet this new year and in the months ahead, when we will be counting on one another so sincerely, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. Now, we know that some things are actually made a little easier by praying together like this. For instance, no one in this new year 5782 will have to find out, heaven forbid, what happens if you try to turn left at the light onto Sepulveda Boulevard. But even better than that, since you couldn't pray inside our sanctuary on these holy days, we committed once again as we did last year to bringing you the most important thing that would have awaited you here, namely the content of our prayer books. The words that we are going to be praying together will again appear on screen. And that's in addition to our offer for you to come pick up a hard copy of the actual prayer book to use at home, as so many of you have already done. It's not too late to do that for Yom Kippur, incidentally, if you wish. You can just let us know by email or by using our online form at our website. The books are absolutely loaded with wisdom and inspiration well beyond just the content that we'll be speaking aloud in our services. So please feel free to schedule a time to stop by before Yom Kippur if you'd like. By now, I hope that you are aware of the full complement of offerings that we've prepared to nourish your mind and your soul on these holidays, many of which are new and specially designed to maximize our experience together in this unique year. Some will be live streamed, some will be in person outdoors, some will be by Zoom. I urge you to consult the schedule of services and other offerings carefully because this year is quite different from last year in some really lovely ways. And we want you to have the opportunity to partake exactly as you most want and need. It's all easily accessible from the homepage of our temple's website with the single click of a button. As for our services here together in our sanctuary, they are once again all in accordance with the current orders from LA County's Department of Health. And once again, the product of an intense amount of talent and hard work on the part of many, many people, both professionals and volunteers. And I am already looking forward to thanking them at our Yom Kippur concluding service. They and I want nothing more for you than to harvest from these days the grounding in tradition, the honest self-search, the living compass that you count upon the High Holy Days to make possible in your life. 
We're going to be putting our all into creating the conditions for that to happen. And we invite you to join us in putting your all into these days by truly setting them aside as sacred. So my best advice, silence your phone, turn off the email, create a distraction-free spiritual environment as you would if we were all seated together here in the sanctuary. That's the tried and true path to a Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur that possess the power to change you. So let's begin our pursuit of that goal by situating ourselves here together. This will probably be best achieved with your eyes closed, even for those of you who only close your eyes to sleep. If you'll close your eyes for just a moment, I can do my best to help put you where you most wanted to be, here with us, with each other, inside this beautiful space that holds so many of our collective memories. With your eyes closed, see yourself here, surrounded by a thousand others, some cherished friends, all fellow journeyers. You're here. After a year where that's not something any of us should be taking for granted. You are here. And so let's take a moment just to be and be grateful and present. Feel your breath filling your chest and let it go. It's another thing we've learned not to take for granted anymore. Take a deep, healthy, conscious breath. And steady your soul. For the new year is here. And we are here to step into it with you in sacred community. So in just a few moments when you open your eyes, see yourself here with us, with each other, ready as one congregation, this beautiful congregation. And let us greet the new year, now born. We praise you, Adonai, our God, sovereign of the universe, who has given us life and sustained us in life, that we might together arrive at this season. Please join us in making Sheikh Yanu, page 11. Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Sheikh Yanu Vekimanu Vehigianu Lazman new year has arrived, let us declare it in joy and song and with the sounding of the shofar. We turn to page 15, and if you're able, please rise. Shofar, ba 
אבותינו ואימותינו, יהי רצון שנזכה לברכותיך בשנת חמשת אלפים שבע מאות ושמונים ושתיים. אלוהי עולם, ברך אותנו ואת כל בית ישראל בחידוש ימינו, בשמחה ובשלום. Our God and God of our ancestors, may we know your blessings in this year 5,782. Eternal One, bless us and the whole house of Israel with renewed life. happiness and peace, comfort and courage, resilience and strength. May the words of our heart be acceptable to you in the new year that stretches before us. We are forever grateful for the gift of life. Tekiah. We continue standing for the Baruch Hu on page 20. of page 23. 
The quickening of the moon calls us to return, and we gather, seam dwellers on the edge of the earth. As the sun lowers itself into the sea, introspection rises. A sliver cracks the heart of the firmament, the vast blackness and invitation to write ourselves anew. Baruch Ata Adonai, Hama'ariv Aravim. We read together on the next page. Love beyond all space and time. Your love enfolds your people, Yisrael. We receive it in your teaching, your gift of Torah, sacred obligations, discipline, and law. So let us speak these teachings when we lie down and when we rise up and find joy forever in your Torah and mitzvot. They are the very essence of our life, ours to ponder and study all our days. May we never lose or be unworthy of your love. Baruch Ata Adonai, Ohev Amo Yisrael. We read responsively on page 33. To break the bonds of anger, to be generous of heart. To break the bonds of shame, to live with self-respect. To break the bonds of envy, to serve one another in joy. To break the bonds of boredom, to be attentive to all God's gifts. To break the bonds of fear, to live with courage and strength. To untie the knots of betrayal, to love with fullness of being. To break the bonds of loneliness, to receive a hand of hope. To break the bonds of self-centeredness, to extend a hand of help. Released from the darkness, our people found their freedom at the sea. We pray for liberation at the dawning of this year. Oh, 
Adonai et Yaakov Hugelo mi et chazak mimenu Baruch ata Adonai Gah Page 37. Darkness settles slowly across the horizon. The new year rises before us, its fragile moon awaiting our embrace. Heaven and earth entwine in their annual dance of recreation. A fissure appears in the firmament tonight, an entranceway into new beginnings. Out beyond the swales, the sea expands and contracts, keeping time to the thrumming of the universe. Under this Rosh Hashanah sky, the path before us is uncertain. All we can do is hold each other tight as we make our way home. Night descends, and we pray for safety and protection underneath its blanket. Hashkivenu can be found on page 36. Hashkivenu Adonai Page 41. You can't rush a prayer to God. If it comes from the heart, it will rush out on its own. Speed through receding galaxies or 
silences in the soul and God will hear. Honesty with all, but speaking to God is different. Mine the soul for your coal and gems and regular earth, no pretense, and God will hear. Don't force the prayer or string words together. Pause, perhaps better not to pray. Silence will be a message of awe and God will hear. Now step off into the very deep, beyond the way of prayer. We glimpse unknown magnitudes of God, no more or we would be stunned into silence. Except that love makes itself small. We could not pray at all. Please rise for the Amida.
continue in silence through page 68. In addition to the traditional prayers, there are some beautiful readings and meditations. Explore the prayer book, work your way sequentially, or find something to linger on. You can remain standing or be seated when you are ready. Page 66.
on page 75. We haven't forgotten Avinu Malkinu. Though we've overthrown kings and we disobey fathers and we have no great liking for absolute power. Akiva stood before you in a time of drought and his words went up like a flame on the altar. Avinu Malkinu, you alone are our ruler. Avinu Malkinu, have compassion for us. He was humble and forgiving, and so his prayer was answered. Tonight, we speak again in a time of drought. Dry ground beneath us, no water, only rock. Not only a hunger for bread or a thirst for water, but hearts that are longing to hear God's voice, for the sea of faith is all but gone. The tide's gone out on the empty beach. The world mocks our hopes and life tests our courage. Why do the wicked live on and prosper? Why are you silent when they prey upon the innocent? And if your dominion is kindness and justice, why is creation in so much pain? Avinu Malkinu, sustain our souls, send rain to our roots, help us find a way to pray. Make us humble and forgiving of ourselves and one another. Avinu Malkenu, renew these words. Help us speak them with conviction and believe their truth. A hundred generations have stood before the ark, and they lifted up their voices like flame on the altar, and they put their trust in kindness and justice, and they gave their strength to make the promise real. Avinu Malkenu. We haven't forgotten. Avinu Malkinu, bring us back to you. If you're able, please rise. On page 77. Avinu Malkenu Shema Kolenu. Avinu Malkenu, Almighty and Merciful, hear our voice. Avinu Malkenu, Chatanu Lefanecha. Avinu Malkenu, we have strayed and sinned before you. Avinu Malkenu, Chamol Alenu Vaal Olalenu Vitapenu. Avinu Malkenu, have compassion on us and our families. Avinu Malkenu, Kale Dever, Vachere, Vraav Mealenu. Avinu Malkenu, halt the onslaught of sickness, violence, and hunger. Avinu Malkenu, Kale Koltsar Umastin Mealenu. Avinu Malkenu, halt the reign of those who cause pain and terror. Avinu Malkenu, Kotvenu Besefer Chaim Tovim. Avinu Malkenu, enter our names in the book of lives well lived. Avinu Malkenu, Chadesh Alenu Shana Tova. Avinu Malkenu, renew for us a year of goodness. Avinu Malkenu, Chonenu Vaanenu, Ki Ein Banu Maasim, Ase Imanu Tzdaka Vachesed Vahoshienu. Avinu Malkenu, Almighty and Merciful, answer us with grace, for our deeds are wanting. Save us through acts of justice and love.
There is nothing like looking into the eyes of a newborn to clarify what matters. On March 29th, 2020, as I stared into our daughter Shiloh's eyes for the first time in the labor and delivery room at Cedar sinai I was at once paralyzed and thought, how reckless I must be as a mother to welcome a child into this world. This world in which a movement seeking to say that black lives matter as much as white lives is vilified. This world in which my hometown of Miami could be underwater by 2050. This world in which my own state, my own synagogue for that matter, is constantly under the threat of fire. This world in which my newborn daughter wouldn't meet another soul besides her parents, her sister, and her pediatrician for nearly a year. This world in which parents are petrified to send their children to school. This world in which wearing a mask and receiving a vaccine to protect my unvaccinated infant from getting sick has become a cultural battleground. No wonder I was terrified. I am terrified, truly, every time she leaves the house. And it led me to wonder, what is the world that we want to create for her, for us? I love the summer months, in part, because I love studying the Book of Numbers, which contains tales of our ancestors' wilderness journeys from Sinai to the Promised Land. There's something so real and so human about these stories, which often depict the Israelites and their leaders at their worst. A common theme throughout the book is the Israelites' penchant for complaining, which often puts them at odds with God and with Moses. In one instance, the people weep bitterly for a better dining menu in the desert, saying, we remember the fish that we used to eat for free in Egypt, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, the garlic. Now our bellies are dry. There is nothing but manna to look forward to. Over and over again, we witness the Israelites struggling to accept their new reality. Terrified by what the future holds, they seek refuge in nostalgia. In this case, reimagining their bitter servitude in Egypt as a day at the palace. And each year as we read these stories, I grapple to understand why they are so stuck in the past. Is Moses not the leader they need if they can't move past their fetching and nostalgia? Are they just ungrateful and not ready for liberation? But this year, I looked upon the Israelite struggle with new eyes. As I saw myself, I saw us. Yes, the Israelites couldn't move on, and yes, they are scared of change and more comfortable holding on to the reality that they knew, even if it was much worse than they remember, and yes, their nostalgia keeps them stuck. But they're also in pain. They're experiencing a profound sense of loss, both in human life as an entire generation dies in the wilderness and in their way of life, which at the moment of their liberation is thrown completely into chaos. And they're so busy surviving that they don't even have time to grieve. Their complaints aren't simply self-indulgent concerns. Their complaints are an expression of that grief and that trauma. This year, that need to grieve rings true more than ever. This year, I moved from judgment to compassion as I began to understand how fear, very real fear, can just as easily get us stuck too. But getting stuck isn't the only option. Each year on the summertime Jewish observance known as Tisha B'Av, our tradition offers us a possible response to the Israelites' complaints in the desert, perhaps to the moment that we find ourselves in today by asking us of us a rather odd task. It's definitely not a modern task. For on Tisha B'Av, our tradition calls upon us to lament, to cry, to feel, to mourn. On this ninth of Av, when we commemorate the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, our ancestor's center of Jewish life and ritual, and really the linchpin of the ancient Jewish community and worldview, our tradition doesn't tell us to bury our painful past. It doesn't ask us to suck it up and to power through. It doesn't demand that we pretend it didn't happen by making our lives so busy that we don't have to acknowledge our suffering or our loss. Instead, it says grieve, lament. 
Tisha B'Av is designed to enable us to spend an entire morning, entire day in mourning, reciting Echa, the Book of Lamentations, which teaches us how to weep. Says the Book of Lamentations, my eyes are spent with tears, my heart is in tumult, shed tears like a torrent. Our tradition asks us to dwell on the sheer enormity of this loss, so that seven weeks later, when the new year arrives, we are ready to return and to rebuild ourselves and our world anew. And that's exactly what our ancestors did. Unlike the Israelites in the wilderness who remained stuck in the past, the Jews who survived the destruction of the Second Temple in the year 70 looked toward the future with resolve and imagination. First, they created the space to grieve. And then they used their creativity to revolutionize Judaism, standardizing the concept of the oral law, exchanging animal sacrifices for personal and communal prayer, and replacing the hereditary caste leadership of the priesthood with leaders who prove themselves through study, the rabbis. And in so doing, they transformed an ethnic cult into the full-fledged religion that we know and embrace today. The differences between the temple cult and the new Judaism were so stark that we probably wouldn't even recognize the other. It makes me think about some of the times that I've mentioned my love of mixtapes to our teen students because they literally have no idea what I'm talking about. And just like the temple cult, mixtapes were pretty awesome for their time and they helped us to innovate to the playlist that we create and share so readily on our phones today, but we're never going back to mixtapes. And we really shouldn't because they no longer serve us. Living through the twists and the turns of a worldwide pandemic is no small feat. And far too many have suffered in its path. We must find our way to grieve and to lament. And yet we have remained at the crossroads of COVID for too long, hoping and praying that we can just walk it all back but there's no going back. There's no when all of this is over. This is our world now. And we can choose to stay stuck in Egypt or we can choose to use our creative forces like our ancestors after the destruction of their temple to shape what comes next. Hayom Harat Olam. Today, the world was created. And what better way to mark that creation than by affirming our powers to create? For we alone among the creatures of this earth were formed in the divine image and given the power to shape the future. This doesn't mean that we throw out everything that we've learned from the past. We as Jews know better than anyone that we should constantly revisit where we came from and what brought us to this moment and to continue to learn from it. But we also can't live there. We must look toward what comes next, but how? In a recent podcast, renowned conflict mediator Priya Parker, who wrote the beautiful and the poignant book, The Art of Gathering, offers a taste of how we might move forward in this unprecedented time by asking us to th think deeply about one particular element, what it means for us to gather in this moment. And she cautions us against defaulting to our old habits when, at some level, the decks have been cleared. Think about it. For decades, we've gathered in very specific ways, often designed for the white, masculine, able-bodied, post-World War II corporate culture without ever bothering to consider if these methods worked for everyone, and let's be honest, they don't. Rather than yearn for the way that we've always done things, we have the opportunity to pause and to ask, how should we do it now? What is the need that we're trying to address? What have we learned from this time of reckoning about our relationships, about access, about equity, that needs to inform the way that we gather and relate in the future. Because in our reimagining, we don't want to skip over these essential conversations. For example, many studies have shown that women have disproportionately lost their jobs in the pandemic, and that at the same time, the people who are most likely to work from home are women, and parents in general. And so Parker challenges us to consider, for instance, how to restructure meetings and gatherings for true hybrid participation so that the people who are home aren't being punished. And then to think about when we do gather in person, how we do so creatively and equitably. 
Similar conversations are happening not just around workplace gatherings, but about schools, houses of worship, even the future of beloved institutions like the movie theater or restaurants. And while many of us are exhausted, just trying to figure out how to keep surviving physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, when there are very real threats around us constantly, we also have to start asking these hard questions that reside at the very heart of our ability to create the world that we want for ourselves and our community. So as you sit in whatever place you chose to transform into your part of our sanctuary today, I ask you, what is the inner yearning that brings you into this space? What can you imagine our world, our community looking like in five years, in 20 years? And how do you wanna be a part of making that happen? Asking these questions is more than simply an opportunity to shape the future for the better. It is in fact an essential task for the right here and now because we're at an inflection point. There are no longer best practices. Our best practices were created for a different time and like that mixtape, they're now obsolete. We are creating the new best practices right now, intentionally or not. But it takes more than simply identifying our goals to move forward with integrity and with care. It takes listening to our yearnings, to each other's yearnings, to the yearnings of those who possess less power than we do, and to consider what is the work at hand? What are our priorities so that we can do our most expansive dreaming, knowing that people offer their most vibrant selves when they feel seen and accepted? We aren't just shifting communal structures. We're shifting how we allocate resources. The rules have changed and it is scary, but it's also freeing because one of our superpowers as humans is not only to adapt, but to thrive amidst change, to explore what we do next by radically experimenting in our own lives and in our communal spaces and to learn and reflect with care so that we can continually adapt and rethink along the way. When I consider these difficult questions that now confront us, I first think about our students and their worldview. In them, I get a glimpse of what could be, an expression of humanity in which identities are fluid, race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, religion, and more. For they see a world that isn't binary, that isn't one or the other, and can hold space for it to be both and all. I get excited about the possibility of creating systems and institutions that think beyond categories, that aren't bound or limited by labels or structures that might constrain our imagination. Our students also crave a balanced existence in which their lives aren't dominated by goals that prove to be more elusive the more single-mindedly we pursue them, but rather a journey where they get to know themselves and to be, not always do. We've already started to see the beginnings of this change, people moving to places with a slower pace of life, people quitting their jobs at record numbers to rethink what they do and how they wanna spend their time. And as an aside, we must take note that these choices come from privilege and that not everyone has the ability to make them. I also see in our students a profound care for the vulnerable for the other and a longing to shift the long-held systems that continue to keep some out. And so when I get scared about what we're leaving behind, I imagine the world that, we, that, that they and we are creating, a world of acceptance, of complexity, and of presence, a world beyond definitions and categories that is much more expansive than any of us could have imagined, a terrifying world but also an exhilarating one. We named our youngest daughter Shiloh as a prayer, as a hope, as a choice to believe in the future, in her future. We named her Shiloh after the biblical city Shiloh, an ancient gathering place that brought people together in connection with God and with one another. We named her Shiloh, yes, because when she was born two weeks after the beginning of quarantine, we could feel so palpably our desire to return to that feeling we experienced when our older daughter, Shifra, was born three and a half years ago, when we gathered together with our communities in this big sanctuary, arm in arm, 
to look out and to know that she would be okay. And we also named her Shiloh because at this crossroads moment in our world, we were committing to participating and to believing in the creation of something new, something we can't quite envision yet, but that we know is teeming with possibility. And we are affirming that even though we're afraid all the time, we know that she deserves the best our human ingenuity can come up with and that together we all can create so much more for her and for us. Hayom Harat Olam. Today, the world was created. And what better way to mark that creation than by affirming our ability to create. For we alone among the creatures of this world were formed in the divine image and given the power to shape the future of this world. Are we brave enough to sit in this space of discernment? Are we resilient enough to try and to fail? Are we curious and collaborative enough to create coalitions of yearnings that will move us what, past what we think we know and into conversation and then action toward who we as individuals and as in a collective could be? I can't wait for you to meet Shiloh. And I can't wait for her and for us to meet this new world. Shana Tova. Good evening. For those of you that I have not yet had an opportunity to meet, my name is Iris Weinman, and I am honored to be serving as your pandemic president. I want to first acknowledge the disappointment that we all share at being unable to gather in person in our main sanctuary for this year's High Holy Day services. Just this summer, we were eagerly anticipating and planning for a big reunion in our main sanctuary for Rosh Hashanah, but those plans were unfortunately derailed by the most recent health concerns. However, our amazing clergy, staff, and some very talented and dedicated lay volunteers have been working tirelessly to ensure a meaningful High Holy Day experience for all of us. And tonight is just the beginning. This has been a year filled with challenges for all of us, individually and as a community. There were so many elements of loss. The physical loss of loved ones to COVID-19 and other causes, the losses felt by mourners for whom the traditional ways of grieving were disrupted, the losses suffered by our children from whom ordinary rites of passage were stripped away, things that we always just took for granted, like plain old school days, lunch in the cafeteria with friends, graduations, a normal college experience. For all of us, there were those planned trips that we had to cancel, the family members we couldn't see, the hugs we could not exchange. At the same time, this past year and a half also brought tremendous joy. The joy of new babies. That includes Rabbi Bernie and her husband, Rabbi Josh Noble, who welcomed a new addition to their family, Shiloh, right at the start of the pandemic in March of 2020, as well as our executive director, Abigail Goldberg Spiegel, who became a grandmother for the first time to the beautifully named Asher just a few weeks ago. And so many others in our community welcomed children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren, with more on the way. With all the hope and optimism for the future, that represents the future, known in Hebrew as Atid. Our community experienced the joys of bar and bat mitzvahs, including that of my son, Asher, this past July. Despite the constantly changing landscape of how these services could be safely held, our B'nai Mitzvah kids were undeterred leading joyful and meaningful services, reading from the Torah, and filling their families with pride. They serve as a source of inspiration to all of us about what resilience looks like, and a reminder that regardless of the challenges of the moment we find ourselves in, 
our traditions and the teachings of Torah endure. These same traditions and teachings that have sustained our people for thousands of years. I look at these kids on the cusp of adulthood and, and am filled with hope and optimism for the future, for the Atid. Other joys that we experienced included the reopening of our outdoor chapel and the ability for us to worship together in that beautiful space throughout the summer. The joys of being able to continue to learn together and from each other in so many ways, including hundreds of us participating in Yom Limud, our annual day of learning, albeit in a different form this year. And the robust continuation of our religious school, which is scheduled to reopen for in-person learning 12 days from now. The joys of singing around Ken's campfire. The joys of lighting candles together as a community every Friday night. The joys of bubbling up in small groups to learn together and deepen our relationships. The joys of being able to continue our social justice work and to make a direct impact on helping alleviate hunger in our community. Along with the joy came many opportunities for self-reflection and personal growth. I hope that you had the opportunity to read the Elul Reflections that were sent out via email twice a week during the month of Elul. These reflections were culled from our Barmidbar initiative, in which more than 300 of you participated to let us know how you've been challenged this past year, how you met those challenges, and what you want to carry forward in the coming year. 300 participants. I believe that is more people than were even able to properly pronounce the name of the initiative. The discussions from Bamid Bar not only allowed us to check in with each other, further deepen our relationships with each other, but will also help guide our temporal leadership in the coming year. I am so proud of Leobeck Temple's ability in this past year and a half to continually reinvent and reimagine how we continue to live our values and fulfill our mission in a time of uncertainty and constant change. Our success in that regard is due to a lot of people. Our wonderful staff, including Betsy Crute, Drew Davis, and Al Jaime. Our talented and hardworking executive director, Abigail Goldberg Spiegel. Our devoted cantor, Linda Cates. Our dedicated associate rabbis, Lisa Burney and Benjamin Ross. And our steadfast, visionary senior rabbi, Ken Chasen. Our volunteer leaders, including our immediate past president and my partner in the presidency, Lloyd Sagan, our executive committee and board of trustees who have been faced with many unique and difficult decisions this year, as well as all the numerous volunteers involved in all aspects of our temple life who are so giving of their time and energy. And to all of you who understood and accepted that things had to be a bit different this year, who remained open to new ways of experiencing what our community has to offer, who continued to show up, to express support, to share your ideas, and to be active participants in our community. LBT's ability to continue to thrive is dependent on the support of our community, not only in terms of time and active participation, but also financial support. As we stand in this moment of self-reflection, we recognize that in order to ensure that we can remain ready for the inevitable challenges that lie ahead, the inevitable changes that lie ahead, we must invest in the future of Leo Beck Temple, our collective Atid. The need to continue to invest in new and rapidly changing technology to prepare us for the next stage of how Judaism will be experienced in a post-COVID world. The need, unfortunately, to continually update our security as we face the stark reality of a rise in anti-Semitism. The need to ensure that no one is turned away from LBT because of an inability to pay, and that no child is denied a religious school education for financial reasons, especially as we see housing prices and the cost of living in our neighborhood increase, putting more pressure on our young families. The need to ensure that no matter what unforeseen challenges arise, we have the means to adapt. Last year, as we welcomed Rosh Hashanah together, I announced our new capital campaign designed specifically for this purpose. Some of you, simply in response to those remarks and in recognition of the role that LBT has played in your lives, especially during this challenging time, made generous donations and pledges toward that goal. 
Others of you have been personally approached in what we refer to as the quiet phase of the campaign and have generously provided support. We are grateful to you, our early investors. We have been slow and deliberate in our asks, recognizing that in a time like this of tremendous uncertainty and upheaval, that making a generous commitment, even for those in a stable financial position, can feel a bit daunting. Our asks will continue in the coming year and will proceed until we have had an opportunity to reach out to each one of you and have reached our goal of ensuring the ongoing financial strength of this community to continue to serve our members for years to come, regardless of what unforeseen challenges may come our way. I look forward with excitement to seeing what our future together, our Atid, brings. Thank you and Shana Tova. Iris, thank you, and Shana Tova. Alenu can be found on page 82. If you're able, please rise. Hello again. I want to take this opportunity to make sure that you are fully informed about all the meaningful opportunities that await us in the days ahead. We have a lot happening. First of all, SOVA's annual High Holy Day food drive is alive and well. I encourage you to stop by the temple between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur with bags filled with non-perishable food for our city's hungry. The temple parking lot is open Tuesday through Thursday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. For many years, our temple has proudly outdistanced every other local congregation in this High Holy Day food drive. Let's continue that tradition. This SOVA food drive is in addition to our regular weekly Wednesday food drive. So many in our city are in need, and we can make a difference. Tomorrow morning, our Rosh Hashanah family service will begin at 8.30 a.m., both in person and via live stream. Our morning main sanctuary service will begin streaming at 9.30 a.m. At 11.30, our children's service, geared to those ages eight and younger, will be held on our campus. We are excited to be able to gather again this year for our Tashlich service at 5 o'clock p.m., 
It's tonight at Will Rogers State Beach, lifeguard, lifeguard tower number seven, and that's where Pacific Coast Highway and Temescal meet in Pacific Palisades. As the sun goes down on Rosh Hashanah, our LBT community ventures to the beach for a Tashlich service where we symbolically cast off our sins in the form of throwing breadcrumbs into the water. After the service, please join us for a bring your own picnic dinner and a beautiful evening at the shore. This is a wonderful opportunity for us to safely be together in person as a community. You won't want to miss this. Friday, September 10th is Shabbat Shuvah, our special Sabbath of repentance and the first Shabbat of the new year. Services will be at 7.30 p.m. and our longtime congregant and board member, Richard Marks, will give the Devar Torah. If you have not yet had the opportunity to attend in the past, it is a not to be missed Shabbat. You are welcome to join us in person or via live stream. Our Erev Yom Kippur services next week will be on Wednesday, September 15th. Our evening will begin with a family service in person and streaming at 5.30 p.m. We will join together for a community candle lighting by Zoom at 7 o'clock p.m., followed by the streaming of our Erev Yom Kippur Kol Nidre service at 7.30 p.m. Yom Kippur morning services on Thursday, September 16th will begin with our family service at 8.30 a.m. in person and online. Our main sanctuary service will again begin streaming at 9.30 a.m. At 11.30, our children's service, geared to those eight and younger, will be held on our campus. Thereafter, we will have the opportunity to study together on Zoom with a special session led by fellow LBT congregant, Professor Stephen Ross, exploring the roots and development of contemporary anti-Semitism and a discussion about where we go from here in combating it. The study session will be followed by an opportunity to experience a beautiful musical meditation either in person on our campus or online before our afternoon services begin live streaming at 4.30 p.m. In addition to all of these services, we have a whole host of other programming designed to elevate your High Holy Day experience. These include a special program for parents with Rabbi Bernie and Rabbi Ross on September 9th, a special, a special breakfast edition of our sweet and spicy cooking class on September 12th, and a special High Holy Day edition of Ken's Campfire to be offered both in person and online. You will also soon be receiving information about a whole host of programs, worship opportunities, and opportunities to gather for Sukkot and Simchat Torah. I know that is a lot of information that I just gave you. If we were in person, I would likely have a quiz right now to see how much of this information you actually were able to retain. But if you were not able to memorize all of the dates and times of our numerous offerings, please check out our website or look for reminders via your emails regarding all of these special offerings for this year. Finally, I want to remind you that LBT strives to be a 100% voting congregation. So for all you registered voters, please be sure to vote in the upcoming state election and let your voice be heard. On behalf of our board of trustees, clergy, staff, and the entire LBT community, I want to wish you all a good and sweet new year filled with many blessings of health, love, and joy. Shana Tova. On page 87, death will come. Its hand will not be stayed even an instant, nor can we enter into judgment with it. Our question why will go unanswered. But this does not mean that we are helpless in the face of death. We can and we do rob death of ultimate victory by living life as long as it is ours to live. To ask of death that it never come is futile, but it is not futility to pray that when death comes for us, it may take us from a world one corner of which is a little better because we were there. When we are dead and people weep for us and grieve, let it be because we touch their lives with beauty and simplicity. Let it not be said that life 
was good to us, but rather that we were good to life. Let us carry their living stories with us into this new year, guided and inspired by the gift of their memories. We join together in the words of Kaddish Atom, the Mourner's Kaddish, on page 90. If you're able, please rise. Itkadal v'yit kadash shemei rabah, be'alma divra chirutei v'yamlich malchutei, בחיי חון וביום חון, ובחיי דכל בית ישראל, בעגלה ובזמן קריב, ואמרו, אמן. יהי שמי רבה מברך לעלם ולעלמי עלמיה. יתברך וישתבח, ויתפאר ויתרומם ויתנשא, ויתהדר ויתעלה ויתהלל, שמי דקודשה, דריך הוא. לעילה מנקו ברכת ושירת תושבחתה ונחמתה, תאמירן בעלמה ואמרו, אמן. יהי שלמה רבה מן שמיא וחיים, עלינו ועל כל ישראל, ואמרו, אמן. עושה שלום במרומיו, הוא יעשה שלום, עלינו ועל כל ישראל, ועל כל יושבי תבל, ואמרו, אמן. The giver of peace. Send peace to all who mourn and comfort to all who are bereaved among us and let us together say, Amen. This year, perhaps more than ever, we pray for resolve. The resolve to acknowledge and to grieve what we have lost. The resolve to reimagine our world and our community as it could be. The resolve to listen to the yearnings inside each of us and within each other. And the resolve to keep trying until we transform those yearnings into this new world that we all seek. Shana Tovah.